Please turn in your Bible to the letter of Paul to the Galatians, chapter 5, where our attention this morning will be devoted to verses 7 through 12. I'm thinking that I've never heard a sermon where a description of the Apostle Paul included a reference to him being a big fan of sports. We don't tend to think of Paul as being particularly knowledgeable of sports or interested in sports. We don't imagine him as he traveled about the world proclaiming the gospel and planting churches, initiating conversation about sports or happily participating in a discussion about sports. Not, not the man who wrote in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. No, not the Apostle Paul. But his divinely inspired letters would indicate otherwise, for they reveal a man who was familiar with the world of sports, the Greek culture, and the Isthmian games. It appears Paul read the sports page, for in his letters he used images drawn from the world of sports to make certain points to those he wrote to, to those he cared for. He references wrestling and boxing in his letters, and his personal favorite appears to be running, not jogging, running, running in a race. Paul uses the imagery of running a race to describe the Christian life in his letter to the Corinthians where he writes, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So, I do not run aimlessly. And while imprisoned for the sake of the gospel, At the end of his life, just before his execution, he wrote to Timothy, I have finished the race. So it should come as no surprise to us that in our passage this morning, Paul uses the metaphor of running a race to make yet another personal appeal to the Galatians who are perilously trending toward apostasy. Paul reminds them of their past in verse seven, where he writes, you were running well. He reminds them of their past to warn them about the present threat of the false teachers and their false gospel, which will hinder them from winning the imperishable wreath of eternal life. And Paul's warning to the Galatian Christians is a warning to all Christians because the Christian life is a race and it's a marathon, not a sprint. Think 26 miles, not 100 meters. And given the importance and length of the race, opposition and obstacles are to be expected. The Galatian Christians had started well. And a good start to the race is essential, but not sufficient. The Galatian Christians had been running well. 
But now they have been tripped up by the false teachers. And Paul's warning in this passage about the threat of false teachers and false teaching is a gift to them and a gift to each of us. For we are not exempt from being tripped up by the obstacle and temptation of legalism as we run our race. So this morning, let's give our careful attention to this passage and what it reveals to us about the race of the Christian life we are all running so that we might run well so that we might not only run well in the present by trusting in Christ alone for our justification before God, but also so that we might finish our race well. Just like Joanne Colby and James Shuttler. Galatians chapter five. Begin reading in verse seven. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. In chapter five, verse one, Paul calls the Galatian Christians to stand firm in their freedom from what John Stott calls, quote, their former state portrayed as slavery, the dreadful struggle to keep the law with a view of winning the favor of God. Since Christ has set them three, free through his, through his atoning death for their sins, they, they are to stand firm in this freedom. And following his personal appeal to the Galatians and warning about their most concerning condition in verses two through six, in verse seven, Paul takes aim at the false teachers and warns the Galatian Christians about these troubling individuals, these false teachers and their false teaching that are troubling the Galatians with a gospel that is no gospel. And he made this clear in chapter one. You were running well. Who, who hindered you from obeying the truth? So Paul uses an athletic metaphor, the athletic metaphor of running, to describe their encouraging start to the race of the Christian life. Paul has no doubt wonderful and vivid memories of when their race started as he and Barnabas proclaimed the gospel and planted churches in Galatia in Acts chapter 13 and 14. And we accompanied him and Barnabas on this journey in our recent study of the book of Acts. The Galatian Christians had started the race 
well through the Spirit and by faith, not relying on the works of the law for their forgiveness of sin by God or justification before God, as Paul referenced in verse Five. Initially, they were running well. They were enjoying freedom from the law. They were enjoying the liberty that Christ provided by trusting in the sufficiency of his atoning sacrifice, his atoning death alone. But their progress in this race was hindered. It was, it was hindered when false teachers cut in on them in this race and trip them. Who hindered you here is a rhetorical question as from the opening sentences of this letter, Paul has identified the false teachers who are hindering the Galatian Christians from enjoying their freedom from the law because of Christ. In his commentary, Phil Riken helpfully describes the effect of the false teachers when he writes, the, the term Paul uses for cutting in, the word hindered in the ESV, was often used at the ancient Greek games. Races were not held on oval tracks in those days, but to the post and back. There were rules against tripping, of course, but sometimes it was possible to get away with a fair amount of interference, especially near the post where runners had to change direction. One unsporting strategy for winning was to impede the progress of opponents by, quote, cutting in on them. And these false teachers, they are the outsiders. They are the opponents of the one true gospel that Paul proclaimed who have cut in on the Galatians and trip them up with their promotion of circumcision and the Mosaic law. And these false teachers, they, they are hindering the Galatian Christians from running well. They are hindering them from obeying the truth of the gospel. Now, you, you might have expected Paul to write who hindered you from believing in the gospel? Who hindered you from trusting in the truth of the gospel rather than obeying the truth of the gospel? But the truth of the gospel, not, not the Mosaic law, the truth of the gospel is to be believed and obeyed. It is to be trusted in and applied so that we might avoid the two enemies of the gospel, legalism and license. And my friends, hindrances, hindrances to believing, hindrances to obeying the truth of the gospel from false teachers and teaching still exist. Oh, very much still exist and we must be alert to them. In his commentary, Thomas Schreiner describes these hindrances when he writes, here we see that the Galatians' defection does not stem from their own doubt about the Pauline gospel. No, others have come in from the outside and have raised questions about the legitimacy of Paul's teaching. Often difficulties arise in the Christian life when believers begin to doubt the truth of the gospel. Deviant teachings abound and intellectual objections to the Christian faith seem to have no end. Part of what it means to persevere is to continue to believe in the gospel despite the objections that are constantly raised against it. In, in this fallen world, deviant teachings about the gospel, intellectual objections to the Christian faith have no end, I'm sorry to say, my friends, and your pastors, your pastors are fiercely committed to protecting you from them so that, so that you, each of you, all of you will continue to run this race 
well. And Paul protects these vulnerable Galatian Christians by emphatically stating, notice, emphatically stating in verse 8, this persuasion it is not from him who calls you. This persuasion, the insistence of the false teachers that circumcision is necessary to become part of the people of God, that keeping the Mosaic law is necessary for justification before God is not from him who calls you. So Paul informs them that this attempt to persuade them to abandon the gospel of grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for this new theology of salvation, adding human works and human achievement does not come from God, does not come from God who called them and saved them. And this persuasion, this message of the false teachers, it, it contradicts their conversion experience. Pa Paul reminds them of the one who called them. So in order to refute the erroneous persuasion of the false teachers, Paul draws their attention to the call of God they experience at their conversion. Paul reminds them of the sovereign, gracious initiative of God in powerfully calling them through the proclamation of the gospel. They, they weren't merely invited, they were divinely summoned by God through the proclamation of the gospel. God himself called them through the proclamation of the gospel. Their call was effectual. It was transforming in its effect on their lives. It was a divine summons. So Paul reminds them that they were converted by the sovereign, gracious call of God they, they did not deserve because of their sin. But this sovereign, act of God. God acted upon them through the proclamation of the gospel, acted upon them and transformed them prior to their response to the gospel. He reminds them of their initial experience of sovereign grace as a reason to remain faithful to it and free from the enslaving experience of attempting to keep the law. And then Paul warns them about the potential adverse effect of these false teachers and their false teaching in verse nine, lest, lest they think this is uh, much ado about nothing. Verse nine, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Here, here, here is another merciful warning provided by Paul as a means of protecting and preserving them. The, these false teachers and their false teaching about the necessity of circumcision and keeping the Mosaic law are like yeast. Now, I trust you understand I do not speak from personal experience at this particular time, but I am informed by those who are, that if you put just a little yeast into a lump of dough, eventually the entire lump of bread dough will be leavened. Original readers are no doubt familiar with this. This is an illustration of a small influence having a massive effect. A small influence having a broad and significant effect. Paul warns them, error spreads. Just a small bit of it, it spreads. So the addition of circumcision as necessary for salvation requiring this surgery for inclusion as part of the people of God. Oh, this, this might seem small, this might seem small and insignificant, but if you add 
anything, if you had anything to Christ as necessary for salvation. Paul has already made clear in verses two through four, Christ will be of no advantage to you. You are severed from Christ, you who want to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. So adding our obedience, our godliness, or good works in in whatever form as necessary to atone for our sins is a denial of the exclusive sufficiency of Christ's atonement. And, And this False teaching, oh, it may appear initially as small and insignificant. Paul says, not so. It is serious. And it eventually spreads, just as a little yeast can't be confined or restricted. So legalism, so legalism in whatever form, if left unaddressed, eventually spreads. It spreads in its severity, it spreads in its scope, it spreads and ultimately influences the entirety of the church. So, actually, this is much appropriate ado about something very serious that is threatening the Galatian churches. And then, th- there, is, there is an abrupt change in the mood of the passage, as as Paul reassures them of his confidence in the Lord in relation to the Galatian Christians in verse 10 when he writes, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. This is just a remarkable verse. It just, this, this, this verse appears as like an interruption to these sobering and serious warnings that we have been considering in the previous sermon and this sermon this morning. Just remarkable. Paul, Paul is confident and he gives voice to his confidence that error will not ultimately triumph in the Galatian hearts or the Galatian churches. Now, now, Considering Paul's alarm, considering his alarm and concern, how, like, how could he be so confident when the churches, the churches of Galatia are trending toward apostasy? Well, Paul tells us how he can be so confident and why he is confident that error will not ultimately triumph. Paul's confidence was rooted, listen, Paul's confidence was rooted not in the Galatian Christians, no, Paul's confidence was rooted in the faithfulness of God. That's where his confidence was rooted. Paul Paul is confident, notice the phrase, verse 10, he is confident, quote, in the Lord. I'm confident in the Lord, not not in the Galatians themselves. I'm confident in the Lord that the ones he has called will not abandon the gospel and desert Christ for a different gospel that is no gospel. One scholar describes this as the optimism of grace. I like that, the optimism of grace. Now, Paul is, he's ultimately confident that he who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in them will ultimately bring it to completion. The one who called them, the one who summoned them through the proclamation of the gospel to himself, he will protect them and preserve them. And my friends, our confidence this morning as Christians is ultimately not rooted in ourselves, but in the promise. The promise that the one who calls us is the one who keeps us. The one who calls his people keeps his people. If he calls his people, then he keeps his people. I I think, I think the Apostle Paul would, would have appreciated the song, he will hold me fast where the author writes, when when I fear my faith will fail, 
Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. That is where our confidence is to be rooted. That Paul is modeling his confidence rooted in the faithfulness of God. Yes, the Galatians have been hindered. Yes, they have been tripped up by the false teachers. But Paul is convinced they will not ultimately be persuaded by them. He is convinced that by the sovereign grace of God they will, and through his warnings through this letter, they they will regain their footing and they will resume running well. So you got to notice in the midst of all of the very strong warnings, beginning in verse 2 and extending to verse 12, there is this very sweet and comforting, soul-strengthening assurance that emerges in verse 10. Paul is confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. And then, on a sobering note, Paul is also confident that these opponents of the gospel will be judged by God himself. And then he pronounces the righteous judgment of God on the false teachers in verse 10b. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. So Paul is confident that the Lord will protect his people from these false teachers and their false teaching. But Paul is also confident that the Lord will appropriately punish the false teachers insisting, all of the false teachers who are insisting these Gentile Christians must be circumcised and observe the Mosaic law in order to be a part of the people of God. No, Paul is confident that the Lord will appropriately punish these false teachers for their adverse effect on the race the Galatian Christians were running at one time and running well. These false teachers are preaching a different gospel, and if, listen, if they persist, they will be eternally condemned, as Paul has already articulated, as he articulated in the opening chapter of this letter. These false teachers will be judged on the final day, and this warning, this warning is to protect the Galatians from being influenced by them so they won't be numbered among them on that day. These false teachers, they they face a most certain judgment for hindering. They, They have cut in on the Galatian Christians. They have tripped them up. They were running well and they have been tripped by the false teachers. And this false gospel. And then Paul adds quite the personal wish in verse 12. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Now listen, if you're unfamiliar with these verses, I I doubt these are verses that are underlined in your Bible. Uh, I think I would be concerned if they were. But if you find yourself uncomfortable right now, very comfortable with Paul's confidence that error will not triumph, he will hold me fast, good, all in. And then Paul transitions And he's similarly confident that the false teachers will be judged. And if you find yourself uncomfortable, 
unsettled by these verses. Perhaps, perhaps what John Stoff has written will help you understand the, these, these, these verses are appropriate in tone and content. Mr. Stott writes, Paul's sentiment sounds to our ears both coarse and malicious. We may be quite sure, however, that it was due neither to an intemperate spirit nor a thirst for revenge. It was due to his deep love for the people of God, his deep love for the gospel of God. I venture to say that if we were as concerned for God's church and God's word as Paul was, we too would wish that false teachers might cease from the land. Paul's wish that false teachers masculated themselves. Listen, it, it functions. It functions to completely discredit the motives of the false teachers, the content of their teaching, and the value they have placed on circumcision. And he does this in order to protect the Galatian Christians from their influence. So this might seem harsh to our modern ears, but my friends, as Paul has made clear repeatedly from the outset, there are eternal implications. There are eternal implications to what the Judaizers were proclaiming in their distortion of the gospel. This, this could not be more serious. And therefore, what might seem harsh to us and our modern ears is actually appropriate in light of the threat of false teachers and teaching and the eternal implications in the lives of the original readers. And finally, typical of false teachers, it appears they spread false reports, slanderous reports about Paul and the message he proclaims and he addresses this in verse 11. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? So Paul is responding here to what appears to be an accusation that actually he still preaches, supports, and accommodates circumcision as required for Gentile Christians to become a part of the people of God. Now, this is possibly an accusation that is informed by Paul's pre-conversion zeal for the Mosaic law when he at one point was the persecutor of the church, or just a false accusation that Paul changed the content of his preaching depending on the audience. There is no credibility to this accusation, and it is contradicted by the persecution Paul receives from proclaiming Christ and him crucified. So the persecution that Paul experienced, the, the persecution that accompanied Paul's proclamation of the gospel, folks, we, we witness this persecution that accompanied Paul's proclamation of the gospel as we followed him from city to city in our study of Acts. And it is an irrefutable demonstration that the message he proclaims of the cross without the addition or promotion of circumcision. It, it is just a bogus accusation because, listen, if Paul proclaimed and advocated circumcision, well, then he would have avoided persecution from the Jews. And we must not overlook what, what most seriously he writes in verse 11. If he had preached circumcision as necessary for salvation, circumcision as added to Christ's sacrifice to become a part of the people of God, he would have, he would have removed the offense 
of the cross. Verse 11b, in that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Those who are preaching circumcision, those who are advocating keeping the law, the addition of one's human works to Christ's sacrifice for salvation and justification. If, if that's what he was preaching, well then he, he's removed the offense of the cross from his preaching. So, so question, what, what is the offense of the cross? What, what is the offense of the cross that he references, that was not removed from his preaching, but was central to his preaching. And, and why, 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 does, why does Paul describe the cross here as offensive? Oh, my friends, understanding the scandal of the cross, understanding the offensive nature of the cross is critically important for us as Christians. Critically important for us as Christians as we run our race and evangelize those we care deeply for and about, those we love. My friends, as, as we gather here this morning, I, I, I trust you are aware that there is much, much in this book, much in the biblical worldview revealed in this authoritative book we love and adhere to. I trust that you are aware that there is much about a biblical worldview that is offensive to a non-Christian. There is much about the ethical entailments of the gospel that is offensive to the non-Christian. And we have a fresh illustration of this as the month of June commences. As the month of June begins, we find ourselves living in a culture and a country that disregards and rejects the goodness, the beauty, and the wisdom of God's design and purpose for male and female as image bearers. And instead, engages now in a month-long, open, and unashamed celebration of what God describes as perversion. The biblical worldview, the beautiful biblical worldview of sexuality is deeply offensive to many in our culture. Increasingly, they are not tolerant of it. They are hostile to it, and they are hostile toward those who hold it, regardless of how humble those individuals are in their communication of it. The content is offensive content of a biblical worldview. And by the way, the, the, the list of what Holy Scripture declares is righteous and good and what our culture finds offensive in response, it's, it's a lengthy list. But without a doubt, the most offensive message of the Bible is 
the cross. The cross is the most offensive message of the Bible. Why? Why, why you might ask. Why? Why, why? Like, why is this so? Well, I, I, I can't improve on the theologically informed and well-written explanation that John Stott provides in his commentary on, on what Paul means by the offense of the cross in this verse and why the cross is offensive, most offensive to mankind. Can't improve on this and I pray that it serves you this morning. Mr. Stott writes, Paul sets himself and the false teachers in stark contrast. They were preaching circumcision. He was preaching Christ and the cross. To preach circumcision is to tell sinners that they can save themselves by their own good works. To preach Christ crucified is to tell them that they cannot and that only Christ can save them through the cross. The, the message of circumcision is quite inoffensive, popular because flattering. The message of Christ crucified is, however, offensive to human pride, unpopular because unflattering. So, to preach circumcision is to avoid persecution. To preach Christ crucified is to invite it. Here's why it's offensive. People hate to be told that they can be saved only at the foot of the cross. And they oppose the preacher who tells them so. The good news of Christ crucified is still a scandal, grievously offensive to the pride of men. It, it tells them they are sinners, rebels, under the wrath and condemnation of God that they can do nothing to save themselves or secure their salvation and that only through Christ crucified can they be saved. Circumcision stands for a religion of human achievement, of what man can do by his own good works. Christ stands for a religion of divine achievement, of what God has done through the finished work of Christ. Circumcision and Christ are mutually exclusive. And behind our choice lurks our motive. It is when we are bent on flattering ourselves and others that we choose circumcision. Before the cross, we have to humble ourselves. The, the message of the cross is offensive, the most offensive message we proclaim. The message of the cross is offensive because it confronts our sinfulness. It, it requires one to humbly acknowledge, I, I need a savior. The message of the cross requires one to acknowledge that they are a sinner, deserving, richly deserving of God's wrath because of their rebellion and humanly incapable of saving themselves through any work they might attempt. The message of the cross is offensive to us. It's offensive to us, my friends, because it does not celebrate the goodness of human beings. It does not celebrate human achievement. The message of the cross is offensive because it doesn't flatter. Instead, it humbles, and it requires someone to humble themselves and acknowledge the insufficiency of their good works, including their circumcision, including 
their attempt to keep the Mosaic law as a means of being forgiven by God and justified before God. Listen, listen, my friends. There is no running this way, there is no running this race well. There is no finishing this race well. Apart from clinging with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength to the cross of Christ. And so may Paul's warning in this passage serve, serve anyone present this morning who has yet to turn from their sins and trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. May these warnings be an expression of God's mercy to you this morning. Rather than being offended, may you be humbled. May you realize you need a savior. May you realize he has provided his holy, innocent son to hang suspended between heaven and earth as our sin-bearing wrath, absorbing wrath, exhausting substitute, receiving the penalty for our sins that we deserve so that if we would but humble ourselves, turn from our sins, trust in Him for the forgiveness of our sins, we might be set free by Him. And may Paul's warnings protect anyone present who's being hindered, you're a Christian, but you're being hindered from enjoying your freedom in Christ and running the race well because of legalism in whatever form. Because anything we add to Christ only subtracts from the majesty and the beauty and the glory and the sufficiency of Christ crucified, risen from the dead. And if we elevate the law and add the keeping of the law as necessary for salvation, my friends, we will only be enslaved by the law, deceived and self-righteous. How do you run this race well? How do you finish this race well? You believe and you obey the gospel. That's how you run well. That's how you finish the race well. Because for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand therefore. And do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage and its relevance to each and every Christian and its relevance to each and every non-Christian in this room. Lord, thank you for showing us how to run well, how to finish well. Thank you for warning us so that we are alert to the hindrances to running well and finishing well. So as we conclude, we freshly acknowledge our desire and our intention to believe that we have been saved from your wrath by grace alone, 
through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we purpose by your grace to run well and to run well to the finish by believing and obeying the truth of this gospel. In Jesus' name.